All right. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, so for me, one of um, the things I really enjoy about getting to work at a church is I've had lots of opportunities to do marriage counseling. And that doesn't probably sound fun initially, but for me at least, there's this weird thing that I really like. There's something uh, kind of unique about like having a couple come to you and go like, hey, we're going to try to listen to you as best we can. Most of the time they don't listen to what I say, but I'm going to at least like, I get to sit there with them multiple sessions normally and like get to really ask them all kinds of questions, try to understand how they work as a couple, getting to really just all, no, no holds barred, just get to ask them anything I want. And I don't know about you guys, there's not a lot of times that you feel like you really kind of have like that level of openness with other people. So I really enjoy it like that. Um, but um, there's normally kind of two different groups of people. Most of them kind of come in like super realistic about like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, we've already been working on these things. These are things we need to work on. And like normally I'm going to try to help them find some more. Um, but sometimes on, on the rare occasion, um, I'll have people who come in who are like, you can tell, like they are not really either been together that long or they are not really ready for marriage yet because they'll walk in and they're all lovey-dovey and they're like holding hands and you're like, all right, is there anything we need to be working on or anything? And they're like, you know what? And they kind of look at each other and they look back and you're like, we've never even had an argument before. We've never even fought. And like they say it like, oh yeah, we're like bragging about like, man, we are just so in love. We're so in sync. We haven't even fought before. And in my head, it's just red flags going like crazy, right? A hundred percent. And I am like, I won't ever, if you ever ask me this, I will never admit it to you during premarital counseling. But my one goal then is to break you so hard. Like I am going to do everything I can to try to make it so you get into arguments. And I have to literally sit there and watch you fight about it. Like every single time they say like, oh, well, your mom did this. I'm like, oh, hey, how do you feel about your mother-in-law? How do you feel about when she does that? How do you feel about when his dad, her dad does this? Because... Instantly, all of a sudden, all the realness starts to come out, and they'll start kind of sharing different things that they're feeling. Um, and they've never, never one time have I had anybody ever actually say this phrase, but I have no doubt this is what everyone really wants to say. They just don't want to say it out loud because everyone knows this is something you're not allowed to say. Go ahead, throw it up there. They always want to say, life would be easier if they just see it my way, right? And just like the response I probably just got right now is this isn't just true when it comes to premarital counseling, right? This is true for all of us. This is true maybe for uh, maybe with your friendships, for families. Can you imagine if your kids just listened to you and saw things your way? It'd be a game changer, right? Or if your spouse or your coworkers, your boss, I don't even want to talk about it. Half of us would be just celebrating every day we get to go into work if everyone just saw things the way that we see them. Um, and at least for, I don't know about you guys, every time I've ever heard anybody talk about this in my life, the first thing that someone will say is like, yeah, but then life would be so boring, right? And I'm like, I mean, have you been with me in the last two years? Like, I would love some boring in my life. Like, some boring sounds great. Like, I got three kids. I would love more boring going on in my life. But unfortunately, People don't always see things our way. So when we get into those issues, when we're trying to convince somebody to see things our way, try to uh, see them differently, uh, we try this thing, and I got this from another pastor that I thought was such a good way to put it. He called it the C4 approach to relationship management. The four things that we try to do are simply this, convince, convict, coerce, and control, right? And you only need to be on social media for like five seconds to know that these things don't work, right? Or like if you have any in-laws, you know that these are things that you instantly like, yeah, I don't want to do any of these things anymore. As soon as you brought it up, now I don't want to do these things. Um, or maybe you're like me. Um, I am weird. I use GPS. Like I use my Google Maps on my phone anywhere I'm going if it's more than like 10 minutes. Even if it's like in town, I know how to get there. But you know what? Why not? But the one thing I don't do is I don't let it talk to me. I just like to look over and glance at it because I don't even want the voice telling me where I'm going. I want to be that level of not in control in that situation. Um, and so when I was younger, um, one of the jobs I had is I worked at an RV place, and I promise this is gonna make sense here in a minute. Um, I worked in an RV place, and the first summer I worked there, I was like a, sum, or as a sophomore in high school, I didn't know anything about tools. I literally, it was the summer I learned that there's different kinds of screwdrivers, and one of them had an X, a Phillips head, and one of them was just a flat one. Um, and most of the time, as I was hired on, they said, hey, you're actually gonna be, uh, you're not even gonna be the assistant to the mechanic, you're gonna be the assistant to the mechanic, you're not the assistant, right? And so I was there, like, helping out, trying to learn all these things. 
And most of the time, they brought all the jobs to us, right? The RV would come to the shop, we would work on it, and then it would go out. Um, on a rare occasion, sometimes the, we would have to go out to like a site, right? And so one time we were going out to a site, and one of the most important things if you're going to go and drive like hour and a half, two hours out to go meet somewhere, right, is to make sure you have all the tools that you need before you go. Well, this is still like early on, one of my first couple weeks, and the mechanic who was with me, I think he thought I just knew more than I actually did. And he goes, hey, can you just go get us together like the tools that we're going to need? And like I, I, being like, again, a sophomore in high school, I was like, I'm not going to ask this guy questions. I was too embarrassed. It felt awkward. I wanted to act like I knew what I was doing. So I was like, all right, what are the tools that we might need to fix a job that I've never done before? Um, so I grabbed a hammer, because that feels like the normal tool that you should grab. And I grabbed the two different types of screwdrivers I had just learned about, and I grabbed a tape measure. Those, <laughs> those were the four things I grabbed. And then we drive an hour and a half to get to this RV, and guess what? Almost immediately, he goes, hey, can you get me that ratchet over there? And I thought, I didn't bring a ratchet. <laughs> I did. And so I did the whole like, oh, yeah, maybe it fell out in the truck. And I went and spent five minutes out in the truck hoping that maybe someone had dropped a ratchet in there at some point, not even knowing probably at the time what a ratchet even was. Um, but... We literally, it, we were there for like so long. It was like a 20-minute job, and it ended up taking us like two hours because like we were literally using all the wrong tools, trying to make, we made things so much worse. Thankfully, eventually, we ended up finding someone who had some tools who like helped us and loaned them to us. Um, but the reason I say that is because so often the tools that we naturally reach for in relationships actually end up making things worse. When we choose those four C's, they actually end up making things worse for us. But what's tricky about them is it feels like we're doing something, right? Because then all of a sudden, like nothing's getting fixed or healed, but it feels like you're trying. And we can get to the place where we're like, you know what? I tried everything I can. I'm over it. It's on them now. Or we keep trying to fix it the wrong way, right? Which again, keeps making it worse. And because so much of life revolves around relationships, it seems like this should just kind of be secondary, like kind of just easy for us, right? We should be able to easily fix relationships, but it doesn't come naturally to us. That's why um, in the next few weeks, we're doing this series that we're calling Reassembly Required, A Beginner's Guide to Repairing Broken Relationships. And in this series, we're going to look at what we can do to help foster reconciliation in relationships. Because in a lot of ways, relationships are like cars. Like, we're all generally, and this might not be the case for everyone, but generally, we are better at starting them and driving them than maybe repairing them when an issue comes up, right? And a relationship, maybe like we're pretty good. We know how to start a relationship, initiate a, you know, a relationship. And maintaining one, it kind of makes sense. Like you got to reach out. You got to talk to them. But all of a sudden, fixing one is not so intuitive. Often what comes first is our natural response. They don't actually work. Again, going back to those four C's, convince, coerce, convict, control. Those are those things that seem like we're doing something, but not always really working. And sometimes we use these things without even realizing that we're doing it. Um, I have two phrases that... Um, I think that we use a lot, or at least maybe I use a lot. I've actually literally not a joke. Um, I'm about to, two statements I'm about to share with you. I've caught myself using them both this week. So just know that I'm coming and teaching from this from not anywhere near a perfect place. Uh, where I've literally had to go like, I'm teaching about this on Sunday, and I'm literally saying the phrase I'm telling everyone not to use. Uh, but these are things that we can use sometimes that are controlling, and we don't even realize it in the moment. The first one is simply this. I'm sorry if I offended you. Right, And when you're saying that, at least when I've ever said it, I feel like, oh, you know, I'm meeting them where they're at. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry that I did this. I'm sorry if I offended you. But what that really is translated to to that other person is you're too easily offended, right? Like what I said, because you dropped that if in there, what I said wouldn't have offended most people, but like you're a little soft. You're, a little, you're living that nerf life. Like you don't know. You're a little bit less mature than most people. So I'm sorry if it offended you because it wouldn't have offended everyone else, right? Um, yeah, I'm sure none of you have ever used that before. Um, or if you are a parent, uh, this next one, I 
trying really hard to not use it because I use this all the time, uh, especially because um, I am a person who generally I can get in conflict and then I kind of, as soon as it's over, I'm kinda, I just move on really quickly. Um, so if, again, if you are in a relationship with somebody and they are not that way and it kind of takes them a little bit to kind of come down, um, this is one that you're really gonna wanna watch out on because again, I use this all the time. Go ahead. I said I'm sorry, why are you still upset? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all, we've all been there before, right? Because again, translated, what they hear is, I've done my part, you should be fine now. Since you're not fine, clearly something is wrong with you, right? Like, I've done my part. If you're still mad now, it's your, it's your fault, it's your brokenness. And the reason that all of this is so hard is because fixing a relationship, again, is not natural for us because we all reach for these wrong tools all the time based on like maybe the emotions that we're feeling at the time or maybe just the feelings that we're feeling. It's hard to kind of always control where it's like, yeah, I'm just gonna do this because this is what I know. But fixing a broken relationship is actually a learned skill. We're not just stuck where we're at. We can continue to move forward. We can learn how to fix these things. Because most of us, if we're honest, never really got lessons on how to fix a relationship. Instead, we've just seen it play out in other people. Uh, maybe for you, um, you can even remember like your parents or a relative getting in like this awkward fight with like another relative or another family member. And it, it was like, it started really small and all of a sudden it snowballed and now it's like they haven't talked to each other in years. And like when we see it and you hear things like this, it seems really silly, right? We're like, well, just call her, just call him. And they're always like, it's not that easy, right? And then all of a sudden, it starts to change, like at different family functions, different things that you're attending. It's like, when are they gonna be here? How long are they staying? And then when you're at those family functions, at holidays, at weddings, you act like you don't even notice those people. Those people act like they don't even see each other. And they kind of like, will even walk in the same room and just go, oh, and don't, not, no, not acknowledge them, kind of do the no eye contact thing and just keep moving on. And then, hopefully this doesn't happen, but a lot oftentimes what I've seen is that someone will get sick, someone gets injured, someone even passes away. And then those big things that felt so big all of a sudden start to shrink. And like those relationships start to get repaired. And now these two people kind of have worked through it, but they've spent years wasted that they could have already been living life together. They could have already had that relationship fixed because this whole time they've been doing three things. They've been waiting, right? They've been waiting for the other person to maybe make the first move. They've been waiting for that person to do something. They've been rehearsing, right? Rehearsing the things that we're gonna say. Maybe you have it down perfect. Maybe that person's like, ah, I have it down perfect, but I don't have the right moment to say it. And sometimes it's just simply we spend that, all that time avoiding the other person, and so when it comes to these kinds of relationships, let's be honest, it can be really hard, it can be really emotional. So what I want to do, what I want to hopefully do this morning is set the expectations and kind of hopefully take some pressure off as it uh, kind of uh, relates to reassembling adult relationships. And so what I want to start with us, us today is changing the goal that we have. Because the goal that maybe you think you have for a relationship and what I would have probably thought I had isn't really the goal. Because the goal isn't reconciliation. Which kind of sounds weird, right? Because if you would have asked me probably even before this week, I would have said, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, that's the goal, right? But this is why the goal isn't reconciliation. Because when, if I would break like, okay, my sons are super big into Legos. We have like a giant, like multiple shelves in like their playroom that are just Lego things. Sometimes I'm a fool and accidentally knock it off, do whatever, and then it just, you know, breaks on the floor. But I can put it together, unless I step on one and chuck it across the room. But I can put it together, right? Because I have all the pieces right there. I am able to do that. When we are talking about relationships, we only have half the pieces, right? I can't ha control the pieces in the other person. We work, we pray for reconciliation, but it's not the goal in a relationship. We can't control that part. Um, and if there's one thing I ever know, this is a life hack, there's one thing you should hopefully hear from this, is that we should never set a goal for another adult. Like, you can set goals for yourself all day long. I set goals for myself all the time. I'm one of those guys who sets them real, real crazy, and then I miss super far. Um, but you can set goals for yourself all day. Do not set goals for another adult, because when we set goals for other people, let's just call it what it is, right? It ends up becoming an agenda that you have for them. And that agenda undermines the relationship. 
Um, and agendas, if you've noticed, don't really help fix a broken relationship. Like maybe for some of you, like the agenda that you keep bringing to that relationship is the reason why it's still been broken all this time because you're still holding on to what that other person should be doing. Like does anybody in here enjoy people who have an agenda for you? Don't really raise your hand because this is, that was, or like do you enjoy people who evaluate and judge you? No, that's why the goal isn't reconciliation. Instead, our goal is simple, but I think kind of hard to live out. And before I tell you what it is, um, I have to show you uh, a movie clip. So I think it is, at least for me, the way that I would, I always, when I think of what the actual goal is for relationships, I think of this movie clip. And let me just say, this movie, I do not recommend it. It was a very mediocre comedy movie. Um, but this one scene has always stuck out to me. Um, and in case, I don't think it really needs set up, but in case it does, um, it's uh, two parents, or a, a, a husband, wife, and their daughter is about to go on a date. They wanted to talk to the guy who's going to go on a date with her. So go ahead, play it. What's up, dog? Not much, dog. What's up with you? I'm here to pick up Casey, you know what I'm saying? What's your name, man? Scotty P, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I'm awake and I speak English, so yeah, I do know what you're saying. Hi. Bye, we're going to go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, where do you think you're going? Would you please have a seat? Hey, those are cool tats, man. Oh, for real. Thank you, bro. You yeah. see the cobra? Yeah, what is this one? Oh, this? Uh-huh. That's my credo. No regrets. Mm-hmm. You have no regrets? Dad? No. Nope. Like, not even a single letter? No huh. way. <laughs> Not me. Well, I love them. <laughs> right, so our goal in relationships is to be like Scotty P. Maybe not in all aspects of his life, but specifically his credo, the goal is no regrets. It's doing everything we could, right? It's about making sure we don't just do the minimal amount. It's about going out of our way, leaving what is comfortable for us to reach out and connect with that person. It's about taking all those unnecessary obstacles out of, that, out of the way to be able to reconcile with that person. And whenever we talk about reconciliation with someone, there's always like a two-person process to it. No matter how much, like maybe that person was wrong or you were wrong, no matter what, there's still a point where no matter who is wrong more, you still have to be able to meet in the middle and be able to talk it through. So whenever we talk about this, this is on both parties. And if you're here um, and you're just checking this whole thing out and you're like, number one, if you're new, thank you for being here. We're so glad you're here. But if you're here and you're like, I'm not even sure what I think about Jesus, like none of this is binding to you. Like this is hopefully, hopefully you find this good information today and just good advice in general for like relationships. Um, but if you're here and you're a Jesus follower, like this is not an optional thing. This is something that is like core of who Jesus is um, Paul, one of the early Jesus followers, he wrote a lot of letters to churches that ended up now being in part of our Bible. Um, and in one of them, when he was writing to one of the churches in Philippi, this is what he says about Jesus. He says, in your relationships with one another, so in your relationships that you have with other people, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He says, in your relationships, think about them in the same way that Jesus would. And so at least for me, my first question is like, all right, what's Jesus's mindset, right? That's the natural next question. Um, and there's all kinds of things that we could go to from here. But I think one that at least for me has always been really challenging, even to this day, um, is this thing that if you grew up in church, you probably even heard this before, is the parable of the lost sheep. And a parable is basically, these were stories that Jesus would tell that didn't really happen, but they were used to kind of prove a point or to you know, kind of explain something. Um, and in this parable that Jesus shares, he talks about this shepherd who has a hundred sheep, right? And then he has this whole flock, and then one of them goes off. And I don't know about you guys, if I'm like, I got a hundred things, and I still got 99 at the end of the day, I'm feeling pretty good, right? I'm like, yeah, it's kind of a bummer, we lost that one, but you know what, maybe it'll come back, maybe it'll get his life together, it'll come back eventually, right? No, 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 that's not what the shepherd does. Instead, the shepherd leaves the 99 goes to get the one, and doesn't just get the one and like get mad, no. It gets the one and like celebrates, comes back, tells everyone like, hey, I got the sheep back, I got it back, I'm so excited we got the one back, right? And that's not normally how we think of relationships, right? Because oftentimes if someone leaves or someone is hurting that way, we kind of go like, if we were part of the 99, it's easy to go like, well, they know where to find us. Or like, if they wanna come back, we're of course gonna welcome them with open arms, but... I'm not going all the way over there to get them. Like, that's their job. Jesus ignores 
all of that. Jesus does, to be honest, like what I think I would say is probably like a really reckless thing to do, to leave the 99 to go for the one, right? He does the thing that I think in a lot of cases, most of us would say, yeah, that's kind of dumb. That's not wise. That's not the right thing. If we were in that same scenario, and I think of like a teacher who has like, I don't know, this would be a crazy scenario to have 100 kids that you're watching. Please, I hope that's not where our school systems are. But if you had 100 kids and like one went off, it would, be, it would be considered insane to go after the one, right? But Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's how important reconciliation is to me. I'm gonna go off to get the one. It ends up becoming something that is like defining to him, reconciliation, defining to his entire mission. It's one of the most defining words of the entire Christian faith. Um, and I, at least for me, reconciliation is one of those words I feel like, um, at least for me, I've only really heard a lot in church and in like counseling sessions. Um, and so for just to kind of make sure we have like the same baseline of what I'm meaning when I say reconciliation, it's just, a, <clears throat> sorry, it's just simply this, uh, restoration of relationship. Reconciliation, just restoration of a relationship. And the story that we see all over the Bible isn't just God's forgiveness. Yes, we do see that all over. It's obviously a huge part, but more and better than that The story that we see is God reconciling people back to him, restoring relationships. And then instead of forgiveness being this, or sorry, sometimes when we think of forgiveness, we think of it as the finish line. But for us, the thing that we need to constantly remember is that forgiveness is not the finish line. I think so often, um, especially parents, we do this all the time, because forgiveness is a little bit easier to control, right? Like if uh, one of my kids hits the other one, um, I know we're gonna have to talk about it. They're gonna have to say like, I'm sorry, I forgive you. We're gonna do a whole thing. Um, And that's the part we can control, right? So oftentimes forgiveness feels like the end point, but it's not really, it's the only part that we can really control. One of the things that we even try to do in our house, we actually stole this from uh, another family, is that after the, uh, my boys, at least they're the only the ones that are getting in trouble, um, when they uh, get in trouble, we then make them hug it out. And like 90% of the time, it's like the best thing. Because like if they were ha- kind of like hadn't really been reconciled, like they're laughing. They're kind of like they know they have to hug it out and they don't really want to, but they're going to laugh about it anyways. I'll, I'll be honest, 10% of the time, it's like the worst decision we could have made. <laughs> and like they fight and then the other one hits them again. And then we, we do the whole thing all over again. But um, I can forgive you and move on without actually reconciling with you, right? It can be something we can kind of take out of reconciliation. And what we see in Jesus's mindset and what he lives out is that reconciliation is actually the win. And don't hear what I'm not saying, because I'm not saying forgiveness doesn't matter, because that would be like quitting a basketball game at halftime, right? It still matters, but you have to continue to go on. It goes back to our original goal of being like Scotty P, right? We're living with no regrets. And forgiveness is maybe one of the biggest obstacles in the path of reconciliation most of the time. But so often, we kind of, they get separated because again, it becomes so much easier to forgive because guess what? We're in the driver's seat, right? We get to make the decisions. It's so much easier for us to kind of just do it on our time when we are ready. But reconciliation takes so much more work, takes so much more time. And sometimes it can even feel unwise, right? You're like, I could have, there's other things I could be doing with my time. Or sometimes as simple as, you know what? It's just kind of awkward and it's inconvenient and there's other things I'd rather be doing. So the goal, again, is no regrets. The win is reconciliation. And just a side note, because in most circumstances, most broken relationships, again, we are hoping for reconciliation, right? That is the thing that we're hoping for, we're praying for. But there are some of you who have been through some things that if you tried to do reconciliation with that person, it would put you in maybe like an unsafe place, maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe mentally, or even spiritually, and because of what they did to you. And if that's the case, number one, I'm so sorry that that happened. But maybe for you, reconciliation isn't an option. I just want you to hear that this part doesn't apply to you about reconciliation. But forgiveness, I hope, is still something that you are trying and to live out. Because even if that's just for your own self to kind of be able to move on from that thing. But 
in most situations, we should be doing anything that we can to remove those barriers to, for reconciliation to be able to happen. Because when we do that, when we are doing that work of reconciling with somebody else, we reflect Jesus. Because I don't know a better example of what reconciliation looks like than the life of Jesus, right? I know we don't always talk about this, but like Jesus, like I know we always just think of Jesus like being born like in the moment, like on December 25th, whatever, when you're celebrating Christmas, and Jesus was born in that moment, right? He actually was like living before with God, as God, before that moment, for all of human history before that. And like celebrated, like being praised by angels and gave all of that up put a pause on all of that, gave up his power, took on the form of a finite human just to be able to be with us, to be able to reconcile us back to him, literally lived out the life where he took out all of the obstacles. And we see this all over Jesus's life. Um, One of the parts in the gospels, um, religious leaders ask him like, why are you spending time with sinners? Why are you spending time with these people? And this is what Jesus says to him. Jesus says, Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm not just going to people who are already with me. I'm going out of my way to reach the people who aren't with me yet. And Jesus, he could have kept his distance, right? He could have forgiven from afar. He could have forgiven from arm's length. But reconciliation, for that to really happen, requires being present, with that person requires sitting with that person. And reassembling a relationship requires moving in the direction of the unreconciled. And if we are here this morning choosing to follow Jesus, guess what? We do the same. Again, the goal isn't reconciliation. That's what we hope for. That's what we pray for. The goal is no regrets to remove every obstacle in the way of reconciliation. And so uh, next week, Uh, We're actually going to continue to look at what this looks like. And so for now, this is kind of uh, ending on a to be continued. Um, And if you're like me, I remember shows don't really do this anymore, but when I was a little kid, when a show said to be continued, I kind of got mad. And so I expect all of you to be like, well, I'm kind of mad right now. That's okay. And uh, but, but... If we're going to be honest with ourselves, reconciliation takes so much more work. Even if I could give you every last step right now, none of us would actually do it because we need time to process. We need time to work through this thing. So what I am giving you instead is probably something you hate me even more for. I'm going to give you some homework. Um, So your homework for this is just simply take some time and think about this question. What's stopping me from taking a step towards them? And I don't even have to tell you to think about who the them is because there's a good chance you've already been thinking about them this whole message, right? That's the person that we're thinking about. And most of the time, when you even hear this, we come up with like all of like the superficial stuff, right? So maybe you even need to ask yourself, what's really stopping me from taking a step towards them? Because so often we'll come up with things like, oh, I've, I've said this myself so many times, like, oh, I've tried everything, right? Have you really tried everything? <laughs> Like, or have you just tried like maybe three or four times and you're like, all right, that kind of feels like everything. No, 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 no. You probably haven't gotten anywhere near to trying everything. Or sometimes we even do the, uh, well, what's stopping me is that I just don't care anymore. Do you really not care? (laughs) Because then you probably wouldn't have already thought about that person. You probably wouldn't already be thinking of that relationship. You probably really care and you're just trying to act like you don't care. Like, what could you try to kind of help foster reconciliation with that person, to live the Scotty P. No regrets life. Because when it comes to relationships, if we are being Jesus followers, again, this isn't an optional thing. This is something that Jesus requires of us. This is something that we get to join in what Jesus is doing in all of the world to help make the world whole again. And sometimes... It's easy to get caught up in like the brokenness of the world. But what if we were people who instead of saying like, I can't fix everything in the world, but instead I'm going to do my best to move all the obstacles to reconciliation. I'm going to do the best I can do to heal this world, at least in the relationships around me, to help join in what God is doing to bring heaven down to earth.